Um, hello, everyone. And that this classroom and also online. Um, the child rights community chair the session today, uh, the Beta Environment uh, Research Innovation Group uh, seminar series. The uh, today's speaker is Dr. John Ting, uh, who we know very well. Uh, so I don't uh, introduce uh, a lot, but uh, just uh, quickly that. Um, uh, introduce John, Duff, who is an educator and also researcher, uh, and has been working on the um, uh, the research investigate Sarawak's architecture history. It's a vernacular architecture of Malaysia and mobile and prefabricated timber buildings in 19th century colonial Southeast Asian Australia. Uh, today's title is the hand. Hand in hand with cross top plates, uh, mapping the contribution of Chinese carpenters to the production and installation of prefabricated Singapore cottage neighbor. Uh, and also, um, the, there was uh, there was a uh, question on chat, but we we are taking John is happy to take questions after his presentation. Over to you. Thanks very much, uh, Hitomi. Uh, yes, just shoot through uh, messages on the chat if you need to know anything or if I'm not coming through and, um, or if there's any technical issues. Uh, so today's talk is actually a work in progress. It's a, I'm working on a book chapter for, for an upcoming book project with Bloomsbury, uh, for which I'm an editor with Paul Mehmet and Tim O'Rourke at the uh, University of Queensland. Uh, we began working together on the second edition of the Encyclopedia of Vernacular Architects of the World uh, when Paul reached out to me to coordinate the update of the uh, Encyclopedia sections on Borneo and Peninsula Malaysia. So what we're looking at today is uh, an extension of my PhD. Um, and uh, it was while I was uh, um, doing my PhD that I was introduced to the uh, Singapore Cottage uh, and, and its construction. And it was really a turning point uh, as it helped to establish the involvement of Chinese carpenters in the construction of the forts in Sarawak that I was studying. Uh, moving forward, I'm going to be questioning some of my now long held beliefs about vernacular Chinese, art, Chinese carpenters and carpentry through the uh, Singapore cottage. So before we get into that, uh, what you see on the screen here is the particular Singapore cottage that I was uh, studying, um, which is in Collingwood in Melbourne. And there's actually quite a few of them. Um, there's actually 10 of them that uh, we know of uh, in amongst a, a larger list of uh, prefabricated 19th century uh, houses uh, in Victoria. Now, this list is only for Victoria and uh, a list uh, put together by Miles Lewis and others at Melbourne Uni, um, which uh, for uh, a project that studies uh, uh, prefabricated buildings uh, in Australia. So before we get started, uh, my PhD was about uh, Southeast Asia, in particular about Sarawak. So Sarawak, uh, if you can see my mouse over here, is actually the white part uh, on the northwest coast of Borneo uh, within Southeast Asia. So this, uh, my PhD really started as a response to, to things that I noticed as a student. I was uh, educated in a very Eurocentric way. And um, at that time I had come from Malaysia and uh, what I noticed uh, in terms of Sarawak, uh, well, in terms of Malaysia, is that there was, uh, very little on uh, the architecture of Malaysia in uh, the standard texts at that time. Mind you, those texts have now changed and there's a lot more scholarship or acknowledgement that, uh, that architecture is produced uh, in, in Malaysia. But when I was a student, there was very little of it. So this is what, uh, what started me on this journey as I started by questioning whether the things I saw uh, around me when I was on holidays uh, visiting my parents was actually architecture or not. During my PhD, I uh, adopted a uh, post-colonial critique, which was uh, really extending the methodologies of the sub Alton studies group that looked at the relationship between colon uh, colonizers and colonized in Southeast Asia. 
um, and uh, which uh, I adapted to Southeast Asia due to the different demographics <coughs> in Southeast Asia. So in the context of South Asia, subaltern studies really looks at the uh, relationship uh, between um, a large group of colonized people and a small group of colonizers. Whereas in Southeast Asia, that needs to be uh, adapted to a different situation where there are uh, different groups at play. So in the case of Malaysia, not only do you have um, the uh, colonizers uh, and the colonized in terms of uh, the uh, indigenous groups, you also have multiple indigenous groups over the country and also multiple uh, diasporic migrant groups such as the uh, Chinese and, and the Indians. So really, I suppose I was interested in, in um, who was involved in producing architecture in, in, uh, in Southeast Asia as a way of, of uh, questioning the, the canon, if you like, as a way of, of expanding our knowledge of architecture, um, as a way of um, uh, questioning the classifications of Bannister Fletcher, who, uh, who wrote a key textbook on architectural history when I was a student. So, um, Sarawak is now part of Malaysia, which was formed in 1963 uh, from a collection of states that used to be British colonies. And before then, uh, it was uh, ruled by three uh, British Rajas who ruled as Malay regents, uh, ruled Sarawak as Malay regents for a hundred years, um, not technically as part of a uh, colonial project. So they really had to collaborate uh, with, with uh, um, migrant and indigenous groups in order to rule. And uh, this is uh, very much seen in their architecture. Um, so uh, these are the kinds of buildings uh, that I saw when I was a kid, uh, buildings that were clearly not indige indigenous, but also um, looked like they belonged to a different uh, tradition of, of colonial architecture. And these are the forts uh, that were built by the Brooks, uh, which were which were also where new settlements uh, were established and the settlements that we see in um, Malaysia or in Sarawak today, generally aligned to a river. Uh, the fort then attracted people from other places to set up trading posts as well as um, um, settlements. So my PhD specific, specifically looked at the fort that sprung on the top left which uh, was the first of the, of the forts uh, that was established by the, the, the Brook Rajas um, of uh, 1849. And what was interesting about this is, uh, is, is not only its adoption of, of vernacular uh, systems and labor and, and uh, construction, uh, but also the fact that that was uh, then um, leveraged uh, to when, when necessary. So this is the same fort. Uh, in, 18, or in 1864, this fort was then moved down to Simangang, uh, where, it, it now, um, where it now resides. So uh, the particular construction allowed for the building to move around. So that in itself was an interesting thing, that it didn't require a, a control of a territory. It was really more about the control of communications, which... Um, uh, which uh, drove uh, the location of these things. And because of the way it was built, it was able to be um, dismantled and then moved uh, down river by, by, uh, by boat. They continued uh, this um, approach uh, throughout, uh, right into the 1930s, where the designs were refined and standardized, as was the uh, construction of them. So these are a collection of forts uh, between 18, built between 1862 and 1875. Uh, and uh, these, uh, they also refined the prefabricated systems of this and that they were made in the capital Kuching and then shipped out to, to these places hundreds of kilometers away by, by boat and by ship and then erected there. Uh, and this was uh, interesting because it uh, addressed a particular labor shortage uh, in the new places which they had conquered. While I was doing my PhD, uh, the uh, Simangang Fort, uh, which you see here, was also being conserved and I was invited onto the conservation team. And it was my uh, PhD research that actually informed the conservation of this building. So what we're seeing here is the, the building 
from the road side uh, as opposed to the uh, riverside, which is what we see here. And that in itself tells us differences between the 19th century and the 21st, in that in the 19th century, all communications were by river, whereas um, nowadays it's, it's all by road. So what was interesting uh, about these, these uh, buildings, uh, apart from how they established settlements uh, in Sarawak and how they introduced uh, new uh, institutions such as courts um, and uh, pharmacies and post offices and so on, uh, is how they were constructed. Um, <clears throat> and uh, it is... Uh, it is it's really uh, built in a traditional timber construction, but not of any one tradition, which was interesting about it. The timber joinery of the building uh, allowed the building to be dismantled and, and uh, relocated. So at the same, uh, in the same way, uh, when we conserved the building, we took the building completely apart and, and assessed every uh, member uh, for, for suitability or for repair, and then we repaired it and re-erected it. Um, and then, of course, there was a bit of uh, sinking in, in places because of rotting of, of uh, uh, piles and so on, which is stuff that was uh, rectified. So this was a very interesting uh, thing about it, is that not only was the, babe, uh, was the building able to be uh, moved, it also uh, facilitated the conservation of it. So one of the big questions is, um, is uh, the origins of the timber joinery um, uh, like who actually, uh, whose traditions were we looking at here? And what we look at here is, is where the floors uh, meet the, the main posts and, and, the, uh, and uh, the floor bearers and joists meet the main posts. But uh, the problem uh, is that uh, this is quite a universal uh, system, which many traditions in, 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 uh, in Europe, uh, in Asia, uh, actually, uh, and in Australia actually use these uh, four ways of, of putting timber together. But when we look at the roof, we start to see something different here. Um, we start to see uh, this um, uh, intermediate roof beam here, which actually supports the, uh, the roof ties going across. And this is a picture of the conserved forts. Um, and this was actually based on uh, the uh, Betong Fort that we see on the left. And then on the right, uh, uh, a picture of the attic at the Simangang Fort, uh, uh, in the 70s before it was uh, renovated. So that is one of the, uh, that is the first of three uh, interesting details that uh, are not as universal as the other ones and, and point to, to um, other people being involved. Um, and this, uh, this uh, intermediate roof beam that we see here is, is actually known as an Alan Muda and it's, it's uh, it's a, a, it's a practice that is common with uh, Malay carpenters. So I think it's safe to say that uh, this, is, this is part of a Malay carpentry tradition that, that's pretty well established. Um, now, the other two um, details are really the cross top plates that you see uh, on the left and also the uh, lightning scarves um, that you see in the middle and, and on the right. So these uh, two details um, are also uh, common, but in in uh, but there's specific, um, I suppose, iterations of it in this case, uh, which which are interesting. And um, so you can see here us uh, us putting it together. And when we were doing the the conservation, um, Asing, who was our uh, carpentry foreman on the on the bottom left there actually told us that he had been trained in this tradition, something we didn't know when we actually employed the, uh, uh, the builders and the carpenters to, to do the conservation. So this was a very interesting thing. Um, and uh, what we also see here is, is, is the cross top plates as it's implemented on inside corners as well as out and the scarf uh, joints, the hand in hand uh, scarf joints and the cross top plates here, which explains somewhat the uh, the title of this talk. So this was uh, something that was quite distinctive for which I had little idea uh, where they came from. And in fact, the uh, one with the roof, uh, I was, was not very clear either. And when I was doing my PhD, I showed these to uh, Professor Miles Lewis at Melbourne Uni, uh, and he really clarified it for me. And it was really a, a, a breakthrough and, and a turning point in the PhD itself, because up to that point, uh, it was really um, just uh, 
I didn't know much about it because there was no architectural, uh, specific architectural information about uh, that time and those buildings. So we're really, um, so I was doing a bit of a historical reconstruction, a bit of historical ethnography to, to look at who was involved, but I didn't know yet how they uh, were actually involved, what they actually did. Um, although I did know that they probably have a significant uh, impact on, on the way the thing went together. So this is the Singapore cottage, one of the Singapore cottages uh, in, in uh, Collingwood in Melbourne. Um, and uh, this is of, uh, this is the house that, that Miles actually pointed me to, uh, which has the same kind of uh, details here. So you can see here on the top, you can see the intermediate roof beam, uh, which uh, until my study, uh, they uh, didn't really know what, was, what it was for. Uh, and then uh, you can see the cross top plates uh, on the bottom right, and then the hand in hand scarves, otherwise known as the lightning scarves. Um, on the uh, on the bottom list. So what Miles related to me was that uh, they believed it was uh, the uh, work of uh, Malay and, and Chinese carpenters. So the Malay one is pretty clear because there's studies on Malay architecture that uh, uh, that talk about that intermediate roof being on the top side. But there was uh, little about um, the uh, about the uh, two details on on the bottom. Uh, really, the only uh, mention of it is, is a mention by Robert Sands, who, who uh, is a conservation architect who wrote the uh, conservation report for this building in 1987. And uh, he said that um, he described the joinery as employing Chinese joinery techniques, uh, which is an approach that Miles uh, adopted. And um, I've since realized that Miles has not actually ever written it down. It's just something that he has said to me, which, which uh, is, is a bit of a clue as to what's gonna happen next. Uh, this is just a slide from, from a, a book uh, on from Lim Ji Wan's book on Malay houses, uh, where you see the uh, Alang Buddha or the intermediate roof being drawn in, uh, which is where we got our information about the roof. So that tells us that Malay uh, carpenters were involved and it, it, it um, really suits a colonial context where there were not a lot of uh, Europeans and, and a lot of others. So um, there was not the ability to impose uh, European traditions on these uh, on, on the carpenters to build things. And these Singapore cottages were prefabricated in Singapore before being shipped out to, to Australia and erected. Um, and and uh, so, um, what happened here is what I suspect happens, and, and I'm not alone on this, is, is that uh, the uh, colonial businessmen who put together these businesses to prefabricate houses um, actually just left it to, to uh, the, the carpenters that they hired, be they Malay or Chinese, uh, just to put it together and, and see how it went. So the Malay involvement is pretty well established. I think that's, that's not really in dispute. It's really more this uh, hand in hand uh, scarf uh, um, uh, connections and the cross top plates, uh, which uh, you can see on, on, the, on the left, uh, one of the members from the Singapore Cottage uh, existing conditions uh, um, recording where you can see Chinese uh, text on it. So the idea that it was uh, made by Chinese um, Carpenters is because of, of the marks left on, on, on the uh, actual timbers, which show you how the whole thing goes together. So this, uh, this also is interesting because the other thing is that uh, Chinese is a very specific language and this is a vernacular Chinese, uh, which um, now has been overridden by formal uh, Chinese, uh, either Taiwanese or, or mainland Chinese. But because of the particularities of the construction, when they imported these houses as flat packs, what they did was they actually brought uh, one of the Chinese carpenters out with the flat packs so that they would then erect it when it landed in Melbourne and people bought it. Okay, so not only were you buying a flat pack house, you were buying uh, the services of a person to erect it for you. And uh, we know of at least one um, of these carpenters, Lewis Amoy, who stayed on in, in Australia and, and ended up doing really well. So uh, here's an image of the cross top plate. Um, so really 
what uh, I wanted to do was to actually find out whether it was actually Chinese. And of course, there's there's uh, images from uh, the classical Chinese text. This one from Ling Zhao Fashi, uh, which is a 12th century government building material, a, a manual rather, which actually looks like it has similar details. Now, um, as Ching Hua Guo, professor of uh, um, Asian, uh, of Chinese history uh, in architecture at Melbourne Uni said, this is a very dangerous approach. And, and of course she is correct because uh, this is a uh, early 20th century reproduction of a 12th century text and probably reproduction of a reproduction of a reproduction of the 12th century text. And also we must remember China's particular situation where uh, out of, uh, there's only been one um, dynasty in China that's actually been ruled from the south. Um, but it was from the southern provinces of Guangdong and Fujian where the migrants, uh, where a lot of migrant labor came in the 19th century to Southeast Asia and then onwards to Australia. So there is a bit of, uh, these, are, these are issues that, that, uh, that are perhaps clouding my judgment a, a bit or, or my ideas. So I'm beginning to think that it is, uh, it is, it might be Chinese, but it's really a bit still a bit vague and something I need to investigate. Now, the interesting thing about this Collingwood uh, Singapore cottage uh, is that uh, it is on the property owned by Andrew Muir, and he's a collector of these cottages. He actually has four. So this is the second uh, of the cottages uh, that he has on the site, which is actually behind the one we were just looking at. Um, and you can see the same um, uh, intermediate roof beam uh, going through there. And um, Andrew himself is not convinced that I'm correct on this because, uh, and of course, uh, that's got to do with the way that architectural technologies are adopted. They're not always adopted in exactly the same way as, as, uh, as they were originally used. So uh, what we found in, in uh, the uh, vernacular buildings of the Malays is that they had a lot more uh, rafters, which are these members over here. Uh, because and they were generally of smaller timbers, whereas uh, in the Singapore cottages they were of larger timbers, so they so they uh, needed less of them, and therefore they needed less support as well because they were stronger. Here's an image of the cross top plate on the second Singapore cottage in Collingwood, and uh, more recently I was uh, involved in the um, in in uh, in re-erecting uh, the third one. Uh, on, on uh, Andrew's property. His property goes between um, uh, two streets. So this one uh, is on the easy street side of his uh, property, whereas the other, the first one was on the Sackville street side of the property. And I was uh, the architect for its restoration in terms of its uh, development uh, approval application and its building permission, but not actually for the building as uh, in terms of conservation um, as yet although hopefully that will come later. And in this building, um, what was interesting was that we've got to see it going up. And Andrew is really the guy who really knows a lot about these buildings um, and has uh, restored uh, parts of it uh, quite roughly by his own admission. And that's because he's, uh, he is uh, someone who, who is, uh, I suppose you call him an, uh, an amateur conservationist rather than someone who uh, comes from a, an academic or technical background. So here we see our um, our uh, lightning scarves and then our intermediate roof beams again. And of course, this is uh, him uh, pre-assembling the roof on the ground uh, before he hoists it up into position. Uh, we see the uh, cross top plates here. And uh, on the right, you see that the cross top plates not only um, happen on the frame on top of the post, but also on the frame sort of below the posts themselves. And then very clearly you can see all the different uh, Chinese uh, letters on there, some of them being obscured by the uh, old motor oil that Andrew insists on painting and everything to try and preserve the timber. So when we look at this kind of construction, really we can see it's uh, in many places, not only in terms of the forts and the Singapore cottages, but also in terms of shop houses uh, in, in Sarawak, uh, where you see here the, uh, the cross top plates of, of various types and then also the scarf joints. Um, and then uh, also even in, uh, in long houses, uh, in uh, Iban long houses where they got them rebuilt after they made money from 
the rubber boom. Uh, they employed Chinese carpenters uh, to, to reconstruct their longhouses uh, uh, to be something more hardy um, and, and more refined, I suppose. So we can see it, uh, and we know that Chinese carpenters were involved here, as well as uh, in the shop houses. Uh, there's records of that, and it's a long tradition. Um, this uh, example here is uh, in uh, Pontianak in Kalimantan, uh, where the Istana or palace there also um, uh, displays the same uh, joinery details. And we also know that Chinese carpenters were, were involved in these ones. Again, here in the uh, um, Masjid Sultan Sharif Abdul Rahman or the Sultan Sharif Abdul Rahman Mosque in, uh, in, in Pontianak, we can see those details. So it's well established that Chinese carpenters were uh, were involved in these things. But I think what's interesting is that when I went to look in China uh, as to the kind of vernacular carpentry that was happening at the time where a lot of these carpenters would have been leaving. So between, uh, you know, from the early uh, 19th century to the mid 20th century, um, what I found was, was things like this. So this, this is uh, the two low houses of the Hakka group uh, in, um, in the Fujian province, uh, and uh, and and um, these uh, houses uh, are one form of of, uh, of a vernacular house uh, in the countryside, which which doesn't actually uh, look anything like uh, my ones because they are a combination of uh, uh, mud brick and, and timber construction. Uh, and this is from uh, Qinghua Guo and Yu Yu Chang's book, The Wayward Da Fujian about the Chinese vernacular. So they're interesting scholars because they are um, looking at vernacular architecture in the same time at, uh, as those buildings in Sarawak were built. Okay, so contemporaneous studies on vernacular architecture in, in different um, contexts. This is uh, a Weiwu at Da Fujian, uh, which they uh, actually led a study tour to. And what you can see from these things is, is much from, you can't really tell too much from the roofing because it was quite common also in Sarawak to use different kinds of roofing and to infill the timber frames uh, with uh, masonry. But what we can see here is with the carpentry, uh, we can see something quite different happening. Okay, so of course the, you don't expect the uh, Malay intermediate roof beams to, to exist here. But also, you don't seem to have uh, the cross top plates or the lightning scarves uh, in this case. In fact, the whole way that the roof is constructed is different because it uses a series of purlins uh, or a series of portal frames, as we can see here, uh, to, to, uh, to construct the house. As you can see on the bottom, what they do is they uh, construct or, or assemble a portal frame on the floor and then lift it up. Whereas in the case of, of the uh, Southeast Asian and Australian buildings, it's really about building it in three dimensions. So you start with one post, then you start with the horizontal members that fit on that post, then you put on the next post in both directions and so on and so forth. So rather than building a 2D thing and then joining the 2D things up, the, the way that uh, things are built in, in, uh, in uh, the Singapore cottages as well as in the buildings in, in Borneo is, is uh, completely different. So uh, I was uh, at the same time uh, uh, intrigued and disappointed when I came across their book um, because uh, it was suggesting that actually what we're looking at in terms of uh, the uh, Chinese carpenters, um, uh, the work of the Chinese carpenters is that very much so uh, it is the involvement of Chinese carpenters, but it is not necessarily Chinese carpentry which is something that has uh, been taken as, as, uh, as fact for, for many years. Um, and, and this is the first step in, in trying to, to um, prove that uh, what I've been saying all along is actually wrong. Now, the other interesting thing has got to do with um, the organization of master carpenters uh, in uh, uh, China for vernacular uh, buildings in the 19th century. And this is something that, that Yu Zhang talks about, uh, which also suggests that uh, it was not actually carpenters, Chinese carpenters that, that left China because um, master carpenters uh, employed a series of apprentices and a series of laborers. 
and uh, built uh, institutional buildings for the provincial governments and for uh, residential groups who wanted big, bigger buildings in the traditional form. And um, they were, uh, these, hmm, how can I say this? These master carpenters had plenty of work uh, within that social structure, within that uh, political hierarchy. Uh, even during the, the late 19th, mid to late 19th century in China, where things were otherwise quite bad, we saw a lot of people leave China. So my, I suspect that actually the people who left China and became carpenters in Southeast Asia and in Australia were actually just people who had skills uh, but weren't actually carpenters and, and that they were trained in Southeast Asia to, to be um, to be carpenters because the people who were carpenters, master carpenters or the apprentices, uh, there was no reason for them to leave China at that time. So, so basically this is, uh, this is where my research is going. Right now I'm um, trying to get this uh, book of Yu Yujiang's translated, at least parts of it's translated. So uh, I can uh, uh, figure out, uh, so, so I can uh, figure out what actually was happening uh, in terms of labor organization at that time in, in that place. Uh, and I'm also looking at uh, the history of, of Chinese migration out of China into Southeast Asia um, and uh, into Australia to, to see uh, whether we can uh, uh, find out a bit more about, about these people who uh, up to this point um, have not been considered or even acknowledged despite the fact that uh, their work is, is very uh, widespread throughout um, throughout Southeast Asia and uh, throughout Australia. So what I want to know is where they were trained and whose tradition exactly is it that we are looking at, even though we've been considering them uh, Chinese uh, since uh, the um, conservation report was uh, written for the Singapore Cottage in 1987. Uh, thank you. We have 25 minutes. Okay, yeah. so, uh, any questions? Yes, Julian. Um, yes, you mentioned the experience. Yes. Work. Um, so I Sorry, I just need to, yeah, because there's people joining yeah. from the yes, um, Thanks for the presentation. It's really enjoyable and uh, very interesting. I'm looking at these experiences. Just to ask you, you mentioned the Black Act, we might have missed this now. Can you talk about um, the sort of timeline relationship from Black Act to the 1960s? Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Julian. So, yes, uh, in terms of Flat Pack, what I'm talking about is, is uh, uh, prefabricated buildings that, that were built in. Um, they were built as elsewhere and then transport and then dismantled and transported uh, to where they were needed. So this has been happening uh, ever since uh, uh, the first fleet. Um, so so when um, when uh, Sydney Cove or, or Botany Bay really was was settled, there was actually a prefabricated house that was brought with um, with the uh, leader with the lead ship of of that uh, of that uh, expedition and and was then. Um, erected in, in Sydney. Uh, and and uh, there were a, a number of other, there were quite a few companies that were actually in, um, there were actually a, a few companies in England that were, or in Great Britain that were producing these things uh, for sale to the colonies. And, and they all used um, traditional timber construction uh, to actually um, uh, build these houses because traditional British timber construction or European timber construction uh, could be dismantled completely because they weren't built with nails and, and they were built with uh, mortars, joints, and and uh, and the like. So uh, that was uh, it's go it goes back that far. It goes back to to you know the uh, 18th century. Uh, but by the 19th century, there were companies that were uh, producing um, uh, industrial versions of this and the Trope's Cottage in, in the Fitzroy Gardens in Melbourne is an example of, of, of one of those houses and by this stage it wasn't employing vernacular architectural uh, uh, vernacular carpentry uh, systems it was much more that uh, they were using machines to produce very 
uh, precise um, components, much like you'd find with an IKEA desk or bed, whereas in the, with the traditional ones, uh, every connection was specific to that place in, in the actual building itself. Um, so what this allowed uh, uh, in the colonial context was for um, somewhere where there was a lack of labor and lack of skills uh, to still have uh, buildings. So in the case of, of Victoria before the gold rush, really it was a small colony uh, with, without a lot of uh, skills, uh, uh, construction skills, and, and also people were um, unfamiliar with, with the local materials and what have you. There's lots of accounts as to how hard gum trees are to turn into, into lumber. Uh, so what they were doing was that they were um, importing these houses from, from uh, other jurisdictions such as Singapore um, and, um, and, and also the UK. And Singapore, of course, being cheaper uh, because it was a, a colonial jurisdiction. And uh, ironically, um, when, uh, the, uh, when Alan Willingham was involved in, in the conservation report of the first uh, Singapore cottage, went to Singapore to look for these things, to look for evidence that, uh, of this construction in Singapore, uh, he couldn't find any. Uh, and uh, the reason for that was Singapore has been redeveloped 27 times since, uh, since the early uh, 19th century. And uh, it wasn't until my PhD that uh, Miles Lewis realized that there was a whole other um, uh, group of these things where, which survived. So, so the, the thing is, is about uh, the picture that we're seeing is about this pan-colonial uh, industry, uh, which we, where all the uh, different colonies um, in, in the Pacific and, and in Southeast Asia and also in India were actually intimately connected. Um, and we're seeing the and this is an indication of the, of the flows of labor uh, and, and how people moved about through that. But uh, that's what I mean by flat pack. It's really more prefabricated uh, rather than, um, rather, yes, prefabricated as, as in idea. And uh, it's, uh, it has more meaning, I guess, because it's really about packaging out into a small, uh, to take up a small amount of space so they can ship more of them uh, around the place. Any questions? Um, Matt Michael, there's, yeah, there's his hand. You can skip. Okay. Michael, please. Ah, yes. Okay. So uh, oh, okay. I'll, I'll repeat the, the yeah. I'll repeat the questions as they come through because uh, um, this is not really coming through on, on the Zoom. Thanks, Michael. Um, okay. So uh, Cornelius's question is. Uh, whether I have examined any Polynesian uh, architecture to ascertain if there are similarities there. And um, uh, no, I have not. Uh, and that is also a very interesting question because uh, uh, I think similar things uh, were happening uh, in the Pacific, although in a different way. So what you see with, with, uh, with uh, Norfolk Island, for example, is that uh, uh, the, um, the um, descendants of the people from the bounty on Pitcairn Island, when moved to Norfolk Island, brought their architecture with them. And their architecture was a combination of, uh, of uh, local Polynesian architecture and, uh, and British architecture. And this, uh, there was a bit of um, conflict uh, with the people of Norfolk Island who were much more trying to replica replicate a kind of Middle Ages approach to, to English architecture, if you like. And then, uh, of course, you've got the um, uh, Kanak architecture in New Caledonia, uh, where similar forms of hybridity were, were happening. But again, it's, it's uh, uh, not really related to, to the things that, that I'm uh, looking at, certainly, certainly not in the uh, early times. But, um, but yes, they, that's not something that I've, uh, that I've looked at. And here a question. So I, uh, I hope that answers your question, Cornelius. Uh, just shoot through any follow-up ones. Uh, Michael Jasper has a question. Has two questions uh, related to the tradition of manuals and treatises. Um, firstly, and secondly, to um, historiography and the recent version of of Bannister Fletcher. Can I can I explain uh, those, John? Yes. Uh, so, Michael. Um, uh, yes, I, oh, I see you've got your you've got your hand up there. So uh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, sure. So hi, everyone. Um, I don't, I'm not sure the room can hear me, but um, at least to you, John, uh, the first question, I'll, I'll just say both questions. Uh, so the first question was, um, is there 
evidence of a tradition of published uh, builders manuals or treaties in in the areas you've been studying from the late say the late 19th century um, you showed a couple pages i assume from a 20th century book uh which we're looking at the sort of the roof construction and then you showed a couple images from uh, uh, uh often re reproduced and and um uh, probably retranslated uh, manual. So that was the first question. Is there, is there a evidence of a tradition of manuals or architectural treaties from the 19th century? Second question, you mentioned Bannister Fletcher. Um, and I, I really just curious, John, is in the, in the and you might not have looked at it, the, the, there's been a re-edition, um, I think in 2020, um, of Bannister Fletcher. And I was wondering if the, if the vernacular um, uh, uh, traditions uh, and historiography has received an updated look in the most recent Bannister Fletcher? Thanks, Michael. So, so the first question was about the use of, of treatises uh, in, uh, in terms of the things that I'm looking at, uh, following the image of, uh, from the Yin Xiao Fa Shi that, that, uh, that I showed. And Michael, the answer is, is no, they were not used. Uh, because don't, we were, were working in a context uh, where most of the people who left China at that time were illiterate. Uh, so um, it was, and, and the people who read uh, these, um, who read these uh, treaties were, were, were not even the uh, master carpenters who were also illiterate, but actually they were the, the uh, um, I suppose you could call them the public works departments of, of, of the various, um, uh, of the various um, Chinese uh, uh, dynasties, uh, Chinese governments uh, at that time. And the second question about whether the, uh, the latest uh, version of uh, Bannister Fletcher's book uh, actually, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase you here, Michael, uh, actually uh, um, addresses any of, of, the, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, of my concerns in terms of, of classification and, and how it deals with vernacular architecture and so on and so forth. And, and my answer is that uh, it tries very hard to. Uh, but in the end, uh, the, the same structures uh, 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 buried within the organization of the book uh, have not really been uh, undone. So you can say that uh, as a text, uh, it has not yet decolonized. It's not yet decolonized. Um, and uh, and uh, Ernest has a hand up over there. So Ernest. Yes. Um, hi, John. Um, I really enjoyed your paper. Thank you very much. I, I suspect I don't belong here quite as much as everybody else. I'm actually a historian rather than an architect, but you know, I'm a historian of Southeast Asia. Um, and that's where I found your, 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 your paper really interesting, especially given that there's not you know, much that is known outside of you know, India uh, about the circulation of colonial citizenry um, within the imperial world. You know, especially across regions and especially across countries. And so what you're talking here, what you're proposing here is potentially looking at... Uh, Stan, I've, I've kind of lost you, Ernest, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just trying to get some sound, but, uh, yeah. but I'm not... Let me just try and fix that before we, uh, yeah. Before yeah. we continue. Uh, I, I, I'll say just, I, I can hear you, Ernest. So, so John, the technical must be, must be the Zoom, because I can hear Ernest clearly. Um, yes. Oh, okay. Here we go. Let me. Okay. This is. Uh, I think I know what's happening now. So let me just click this. Um, okay. Can you say that again, Ernest, yeah. please? Yeah. So if, can you hear me fine now? Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> I might. I well, might. How type annoying. This. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So Ernest, uh, can you? If you can't hear. Um, I can hear you now. Yes, ah, you, you yes. can hear me now. Okay, yeah. good. And like I was saying, you know, there's there's a lot that you're contributing here, even from a historian's perspective. But I guess I had two 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 comments uh, in general. The first is, or rather, a question and a comment. The first was um, in relation to your search for you know carpenters who or the, or the skilled laborers who who carried these ideas out from China. Um, have you looked at uh, port records, especially imperial port records? Um, and of course, the, de the destination port records, as well as um, <coughs> clan associations uh, records. Um, it'll depend on whether on what the time period in question is, but I would assume that if they were skilled laborers, especially since many of these 
um, uh, laborers were organized according to dialect group, as you'll know, uh, um, they would be, uh, these would be the places where they would find work and sort of move, you know, pass opportunities on and so on. And I guess the other thing that I also wanted to point out was that in more recent uh, scholarship, um, your comment about sort of, you know, or the assumption that you're working on that, that they were illiterate, um, more recent historical scholarship on migration out of China um, has turned that on its head just a little bit because we can, we, we, we now know that there is a small but quite significant proportion of literate sort of immigrants and that proportion grows as we progress through the 19th century. I mean, the, with the uh, uh, sort of, by the time you get to a t uh, the era where female immigration is allowed, which is the late 19th century, suddenly you have all these people leaving uh, and many of them sort of, you know, um, highly educated uh, uh, as well. So I guess sort of just a couple of things that I wanted to sort of- uh, Thanks, thanks Ernest. For those people in the room, Ernest's question was uh, really, uh, was coming uh, from a historian's point of view uh, in terms of uh, looking at, at port records and, and the like uh, in, in terms of being able to inform uh, my study. And the second thing Ernest was talking about was uh, the uh, levels of uh, literate um, uh, migrants out of China changing throughout the 19th century. So, uh, yes, Ernest, uh, um, I, I think well, everything we know uh, so far is, is through port records, uh, Australian port records in Melbourne, Melbourne port records, or Victorian, I suppose. Um, and uh, the thing is that uh, they didn't really record these kinds of things in Singapore and certainly didn't <laughs> in, in Sarawak, is, is the first problem. And the other problem is, is that um, uh, the clans were, were uh, very much um, uh, encouraged in, in the peninsula, so Singapore, Penang, uh, and Malacca, and then later on in, in the uh, Malay states. Uh, but um, they were very much frowned upon in, in Sarawak because of um, the, uh, the Hakka uh, gold miners' rebellion of, uh, in the uh, late, um, in the late uh, oh, in the, in the uh, mid 1850s. So we have we see a different clan structure in Sarawak to say Penang or Singapore, um, and uh, and really those kinds of things uh, weren't uh, weren't really recorded in the same way. And the other thing is that uh, to do with literacy, you do see plenty of of um, uh, literate people that were involved in in Chinese communities in in say in Penang and Singapore. Uh, and, and less so in Sarawak in the, in the early days, although that also changed. Uh, so it, it was not only clans in, in, um, in, in Penang, but also guilds, and those kinds of guilds didn't uh, exist in, uh, in Sarawak. More what they did was they actually brought out people from Penang to do a, a project, and then those people then went back to, to Penang. But, uh, and, and please uh, don't excuse yourself from coming at it from the point of view of a historian, because I think this study very much is a multidisciplinary one. So it's, it's not really, and, and it's, it has to be multidisciplinary because of the limitations of, of, of architectural, uh, of architectural um, research uh, in, the, in this way. So uh, really, if, you know, if, uh, it, you know, if Bannister Fletcher hasn't written about it, then, then really uh, it doesn't exist, right? So uh, <laughs> we need, uh, we need other other uh, approaches to to address this uh, this shortfall. But it was an amazing paper. So thank, thank you, Ernest. Thank you. Um, are there? Okay, so there is uh, so there is another question here from uh, from Cornelius, uh, which says, "Isn't the appearance of Chinese texts on the carpentry joints uh, indication of a?" Uh, level of literacy, this would also indicate that the carpenter sent with the flat pack needed to be recognized the text to be, uh, i.e. be literate. And, and yes, uh, yes, Cornelius, that's a very good point. So, so I think there was definitely a, 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 a recognition of, of certain um, characters that were used in construction. Uh, but I think what I meant in terms of literacy was that they weren't um, uh, educated, educated, you know, it's not, not that they went to school, it's something that they would have uh, learned in a, a vernacular way from the workplace. But there's a really good point. Um, and, and also, I'll just expand a little bit on the form of Chinese that they use in that uh, uh, to date, and not to say that we won't find anyone 
who knows about it. But to date, basically, no one has actually been able to read uh, those Chinese uh, characters because they are of a form of Chinese that is not uh, known uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, traditional scholars of the Chinese language, if you like. So I think very much that uh, we're looking at, at a kind of vernacular uh, type of, of situation, um, rather, which is, which is another thing that's, that's kind of adding to, to uh, uh, the, the issues of trying to find out exactly what went on. But that is a really good point in, in that uh, there was a level, level of literacy and they weren't completely illustrate. Uh, thank you, Cornelius. Um, are there any other questions? So, ah, sorry. yes, certainly. So, I just sound, uh, just curious to you that you talked about um, men with Janet as helping, I'm sorry, teacher helping you, that he said that he is, he, he has, he has a, he knows how the traditional buildings was constructed. Is there any system recognition that in Chinese uh, traditional building that are uh, only such as like uh, only licensed people can do that. For example, the Japanese shrine and temples, we have the special training for those people. Yes, that's a very good question. So I'm, I'm just uh, sharing the, the, the screen again. And um, uh, in Yu Yu Zhang's book, she does, she, it's, it's, she actually discusses this. So, so, uh, Really, when you talk to people who are familiar with these kinds of master carpenters, and they still and they still exist today, and in over the last thirty years, the Chinese government has been encouraging uh, uh, the people with these skills to continue going, and they are the ones who are actually giving uh, work to uh, to um, they are actually the ones who are giving work to uh, to the Chinese government are giving uh, projects to these uh, master carpenters to to um, continue their skills. And uh, what happens is that it is, it is through a apprentice system. So my communications with, with Dr. Zhang have, have uh, are limited because of my lack of Chinese and her limited English, although she's better than me because at least she has some and I have no Chinese. Um, what she has uh, revealed uh, and why I need to get into this book is, is that she, she has, managed to um, uh, get into the opaque world as to how this, how this works. So these people don't share their secrets. Yeah? So really what happens is, is that you've got the master carpenter who, who has uh, all the skills and the knowledge, and the master carpenter is the one who also maintains the network with, with government officials and, and clients. Uh, and, and, uh, and the skill of the master carpenter is, is in the... Um, uh, designing uh, a, a, what they call a building ruler, where they put all the information, what we would call architectural drawings, they compress that into this one special ruler uh, from which every part of the building can be known through this ruler. Um, and what happens is that uh, the, um, uh, the skills are, are passed on in a very limited way. So the, the, the master carpenter will have um, uh, a number of apprentices over his career. And, um, and the idea is, is to pass on the skills to the apprentice best able to look after the organization, the building organization. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, in, in traditional Chinese society, it's preferred that this is one of, of the sons or the relatives, but this is not necessarily the case because it's really the preservation of the skills that is most important. So what they do is, is that, uh, it just gets to a stage, and of course, we're talking about sort of, uh, um, I suppose, pre-modern labor, um, a context of pre-modern pre labor. So these guys never retire. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when they are not able to work anymore, they just stop. And then, um, and then the next person who, who is their uh, main lieutenant um, uh, takes over. And, and they have to time it very carefully because it is at that point uh, where it seems that it is at, only at that point where all of the secrets are finally revealed. So um, there may be six or seven of these people throughout the master type of this uh, career, and they won't actually tell you anything about it until you have shown that you know how to do it and, and you're trustworthy, yeah. and then you, you get to, you're able to then run that, yeah. that uh, carpentry organization. 
So it, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing, and it, it's certainly not transparent even to this day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's such a story that in Japan, that sort of the uh, architectural techniques of the shrine and temple, which is a quite decent one, have sort of the family. But same family always have that job. So mm. they have secrets, they, they can keep the secrets in the family. It's, mm. not, it's not in like that case now because uh, because of the depopulation, you know, less young people interested, but but it's like it's a bit like that, a bit similar. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yes, no, it, it, there are a lot of uh, similarities in, in the in the traditional yeah. um in the traditional uh yeah. societies of of, uh, of of both countries. Yeah. And um, uh, China is, I mean, the problem with Japan is, is that Japan is, you know, the, the Chinese, as we can see on this slide, is that they actually still do everything traditionally. Um, so they have traditional tools to do everything with, and, and they do use traditional materials as well. Um, <clears throat> and um, I think the thing, the difference is that uh, certainly with Shinto shrines in Japan, the, the reconstruction of Shinto shrines traditionally every 20 years, puts a different angle on it because um, you need specific timber and what yeah. have you. Uh, so the constant rebuilding, now they've run out of timber, of, of that timber, yeah. so they can't rebuild every 20 years, they've had to push it out. Uh, whereas in, in the, uh, in the uh, Chinese situation, it, it's a slightly different context uh, because they don't actually rebuild it. Once it's built, it it's basically stays up there until it's, it's rebuilt with new materials mm -hmm. like you know, at, at, at which time it's deemed to be necessary. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. Let Is me see. Any, are there, um, are there any other any questions? Question? No, I think that, um, yeah, I think that's it. Okay, so it's, time is running out anyway. <laughs> So uh, thank you so much, John, for a very interesting presentation. And I think the next one is next week. Yeah, next one is, we have a, this is I think weekly seminar. So we have the same seminar at 1.30 on Mondays.